It's true, the world needs better, stronger, more innovative ways of building and delivering goods while keeping the workforce in focus. And with me now to talk about getting that job done are Ravethi, Advaithi, I'm sorry, I butchered your name here, Ravethi Advaithi, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Flex, and Carlos Brito, Chief Executive Officer at Anheuser-Busch InBev. Thank you both for being here. And uh, we are going to have some questions or time for questions, so please put those in the chat. Um, Carlos, I want to begin with you. Um, uh, first of all, everyone calls you Brito. I know this comes from your your days in the Jesuit school, right? You're you're like Cher and Bono and and Madonna. You're you're known the world over <laughs> with one name. But um, you, I don't want to bury the lead here. But last month you announced, after 32 years, uh, you're 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 stepping down from your august perch. Um, you spent almost half of that as CEO, your long time, uh, and, and had a remarkable record. And I just want to highlight some of the things that sales grew from $13.8 billion during your tenure to $48 billion in the last 12 months. Market cap grew from $26.6 billion to $159 billion, making you one of the 100 most valuable companies in the world. Congratulations. And in, in two or three words, what can we learn from that? <laughs> Well, what I learned from it in my, well, first, thank you for having me here. Yeah, it has been 32 incredible years at our company here. And what I learned day in and day out is that the power of people and talent is what makes the whole difference. That's the only sustainable competitive advantage in a culture that has to do with ownership, transparency, high standards, and high performance orientation. That's what I learned every day. Well, we're going to talk seriously about but not just success and growth and the opportunities there, but but really about supply chains and about what we've seen disrupted over the last year. And Ravethi, um, and I apologize for butchering your name earlier, but you know what we saw a year of shipping delays, uh, of, of really supply chains breaking down and having to be rebuilt. And today, uh, the Biden administration announced uh, a new initiative. I know you've been talking to uh, Secretary Raimondo about that, which we just had a great conversation with. Um, talk a little bit about what you see as the sort of way forward to start rebuilding. What, what are the elements that we need? Yeah, we're very excited with the announcement today of a task force to look at supply chain long term for the U.S. We think the potential with the combination of tariffs becoming such a significant part of the world. But then after that pandemic has really driven this conversation of how do you manufacture? How do you make things closer to home? How do you make a supply chain that's resilient? And so we think that this is a very important topic because everything from rare metals to semiconductor chips to, you know, plastics has come into question in the last year. Mm -hmm. So our view is that almost every country is reevaluating where they sit in the supply chain and doing that with a well integrated thought process is super important. So we're very excited to see the U.S. government take this on. And we think that the future of manufacturing is important to jobs in this country. And so it fits really well with the idea behind this task force. Yeah, no, that's those are wonderful answer because, you know, it really does raise a, a question that, that every CEO has to, to wrestle with, which is you either build in redundancy or you reduce cost. Right. I mean, those are the that's the challenge right there. And Brito, I mean, after your years uh, running this global beverage company, um, you had to deal with that t time and time again. Um, you know, and many of your solutions had to do with local suppliers and local yeah. um, distribution centers. Yes, yeah, so so I mean, so Cliff, 95. Go ahead. No, that was go ahead, please. No, no I was going to say that 95 percent of what we produce and sell are locally sourced. So in a way, we're very lucky that we're able to localize everything we could from, you know, farmers and, you know, farming the products we need to packaging producers close to where we are, to water supply, of course, being local, and we sell local. So our supply chain is not one of those that stretch the whole world. You know, 95%, it's all in that one region. I source locally water, farming products. I hire my people locally. I brew locally, sell back to my consumers locally. So we didn't have that kind of 
uh, supply chain that other industries have, like the car industry, I would imagine that you have chips coming from somewhere, parts coming from some other place, and it's a whole global supply chain. Ours is much, much more local. Ravethi, is I, you know I've heard this expression before that that local is the new global. Um, is how how relevant is that to your world as you're pr producing things? You know, I would say that it is becoming more and more uh, relevant, right? Because people don't want to be stuck with long supply chains where you're dependent on products coming from everywhere in the world. And the pandemic showed how difficult that is. So the fact that Carlos is saying that his is all local, that's amazing because he didn't have the same issues that many companies had. But if you're making a phone or a computer or a vacuum cleaner, which are all in high demand during the pandemic, that supply chain is so stretched out that nobody wants to try to keep doing that over and over again. So it's becoming very relevant that how much can you make closer to the end consumer so you don't have to put it in a shipping container and ship through the world. Then the sustainability aspect of that is again, Cliff, a very, very significant conversation, right? But so I would say it's becoming very relevant to what the future is going to be all about. You know, let me let me follow up with that because you know you have these six divisions, all which are substantial in revenue, well over a billion dollars. Um, but they they make those those phones and those vacuum cleaners and all the things you talked about, the beverage machines that that you sell to uh, Brito's company. Um, a number of these things. What are you seeing in terms of the sort of outlook for growth? Since you're you're essentially a, a leading indicator for that because people have to start investing and and in, in buying in some of the supplies that you provide the machinery yeah and i'd say that even through the pandemic it was amazing to see everything from consumer electronics to home goods you know like the drinkworks product we make for carlos company you know really doing amazingly well because consumers were ordering things to come home you know whether you're talking about a vacuum cleaner or a computer so demand has been very very strong through the pandemic and now what you're seeing is the return back whether it's you're buying a car or whether you're looking to, you know, of course, invest in, uh, you know, any kind of industrial capital is coming back. Medical has always been strong. So demand's looking fantastic, Cliff. I think the challenge is looking forward with the availability of labor, which is a big conversation everywhere we go. I think that's significant. And then just the supply to keep up with the demand. So right now, demand's looking very, very strong. I would say Labor and supply of materials are the two big, um, I'd say, bottlenecks in terms of meeting that demand. But I think we're all bullish about most end segments, whether it's medical or car or consumer electronics or industrial or, or looking very strong. Yeah, and now this issue about labor and the challenge for the war on talent, the war to just keep people happy and in their jobs, um, it, it's, we just hear this conversation everywhere we go um, at Fortune. It, you know, it's in corporate executive suites and boardrooms everywhere. Um, Carlos, uh, you know, as you sort of have, have looked over the past year um, at, at where your biggest growth opportunities are for your successor, where, where are you trying to find talent that's the hardest? No, I mean, I think uh, I think today there is a big demand for tech talent, and every company is becoming, you know, way a tech company as well. Because I mean, for example, in, in our business, we have uh, you know six million uh, customers, retailers that we service on a weekly basis, and two billion consumers that buy our products on a weekly basis. So we're trying to digitize the relationship with them, give them more convenience, bring beer to their doorsteps empower the retailer with apps in which he or she has everything that's relevant to his category of retailing. You know, so we're trying to curate content for them. So, and going back to your question, we see that there is a high demand for tech talent. And that's something that's the same everywhere in the world. You know, we operate around the world in all continents and you see that high demand everywhere. So that's one thing that we're very focused on.
Yeah. And and one of the challenges, of course, is uh, the pandemic still isn't over. Uh, we still have a lot of people that aren't vaccinated. We've got variants emerging. Uh, these are these are challenges for, for both of your businesses. Uh, Brito, I, I know you just uh, agreed with the Biden administration to to provide a beer with every new shot uh, that comes. For, really? if, the, if the population uh, if, of vaccinated people reaches 70 percent. Right. So it's, it's a new boiler maker, right? A beer and a shot, uh, you know. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about um, why you made that decision to sort of participate in that in that program. Well, Cliff, since the very beginning of the pandemic, and that's not different from other crises or, or, or tough issues that communities had to face, we as a company have been very involved in helping communities bridge the pandemic and what was needed, from masks to face shields to hand sanitizers because we deal with ethanol, to building hospitals in some countries, to uh, providing water relief in places that were needed, to using our trucks that were idle to help governments distribute, you know, much needed staples to hard hit communities. So, you know, to provide places for blood drives because everybody was talking about vaccination. What about blood drives that has to continue? So we teamed up with the NFL, the NBA to provide stadiums. And so people could have social distancing and do blood drives. Because of that, we've been, as always, very involved with the community because, again, we're a local business. And because of that, we saw the need to celebrate freedom once certain benchmarks are hit or thresholds. And President Biden put a, a, a challenge out there and said, okay, X percent of the population needs to be vaccinated, adult population, by, by July 4th. And we said, again, being very involved in the community, we said that's going to be great. Then we're going to go back to a new normal, to the normal life. So we're going to chip in and we're going to give a beer for everybody that's vaccinated. That first beer is on us. <laughs> What's that going to cost you? Oh, I'm not worried about the cost. We're just, uh, you know, we're just <laughs> celebrating consumers being able to have, go back to their normal lives. I mean, you know, you know, consumers, they are dying to go back to bars, pubs, restaurants, traveling, music concerts, the ballpark, all the things. And that's so much part of our business and so much about people meet, how people meet and exchange ideas. And the world's a better place because of that, because people meet, exchange ideas, and the diversity of ideas create better ideas, better memories, better solutions. So we always say that we're in the business of bringing people together for a better world. Whenever people come together and moments are memorable, the world's a better place. And that's what we've been missing in this past year. You know, Ravethi, I, I mo a moment ago I, I said that, you know, the local is the new global, but really global is, is always global, right? And, you know, we do have, we learned that during the pandemic. We learned how quickly a virus can go through 140 companies without doing a single border check um, and, you know, going through customs. Um, and yet your and your manufacturing, um, you know, is of course a global business. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you are sort of protecting against um, some of the emerging variants in many of the places that you uh, produce, and what you're doing to protect your your not only your your employees but your supply chains as best you can. Yeah, I'd say, you know, Cliff, 165,000 employees, right, in 30 countries. Um, while in the U.S., it feels like life's coming back to normal. We have a big population in Malaysia, which is just going through a shutdown. We have a big population in India, which is, has its own challenges. And then, you know, Brazil, where we have a large population of our employees. So uh, for us this year, uh, while in many countries it feels like it's over, it really isn't because we have thousands of our employees who are still at risk in many of these countries. So it's an everyday scenario for us. Unfortunately, we've got very good at this, right? Whether it's, you know, testing, whether it's social distancing, all of that, we've got really good at managing our factories across the world. And we have the same set of values and practices across the world, it doesn't matter where the factory is. And that really helps us keep our people safe. But what we're trying very, very hard to do is now help uh, acquire vaccinations in countries where it's not available, right? So like Mexico, the U.S. is helping do a drive into Mexico and all the Maquiladora factories. And Flex is a huge part of enabling that type of a vaccination event. 
we're trying to partner with the government in Malaysia to do the same thing. So we're doing that in every country we're in where vaccinations may not be available, where we can help procure and bring it into the country to help our employees and also our communities. So it is quite a big work, Cliff. And unfortunately, I'll say we're not out of the woods yet, but looks like there's line of sight to get there. You know, Carlos, from your vantage point, 32 years in this, in, at working for Anheuser Bush, 15 or so, you know, running, uh, running the company, uh, it's, we've seen a big change in the last five, 10 years about companies sort of taking the kinds of initiatives that Ravethi just mentioned, sort of really getting involved in things that were, would otherwise be, you know, the, the domain of governments or even nonprofits. Um, is, is that change here to stay? Are companies more and more entrenched in our daily lives in that way? I think so. I mean, here at the, our company, Anheuser Bush InBev, We've always been, again, very involved with the community just because we are a community player. Our business is local. We're a global company, but local business. So we've always been involved with uh, water relief for whenever there was a hurricane or, you know, fire or, you know, whenever there was a drought, we open up our breweries like we did in Cape Town two or three years ago when the city was going to day zero where faucets would be dry and we open up, everybody could come share our water at no cost and we organize lines with the police and all that. So, I mean, that has always been very second nature to us because again, our own people live in those communities. So in, in, in Africa, in South Africa, in those days, they had water that was very scarce at home, but they would come to the brewery, there was enough water. So it was only fair that we would share our wealth, you know, with the community because the water at the end is not ours, it's everybody's water. So, uh, Community, but I think you're right. I think people expect these days, especially consumers, that you do more than just sell a product, that you stand for something, and that you help communities. Because today, what we help, what we learned, all of us around the world during this pandemic, is that collaboration, cooperation is the only way to really solve complex problems. And those are perfect words for us to leave it this conversation. Thank you both very much uh, for this illuminating conversation. Thank you.